Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we are back. Hey, it's Friday. Happy Friday. That's right. I've never seen a child happier to be at the end of a school week than we Zoe talking, this morning. Oh, we're talking about Zoe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she was. Oh, my. End of first grade online with Mrs. Week two. With Mrs. Harris, her school I teacher, yes. sitting in front of the computer, watching her take uh, Spanish in you know Spanish lessons, math lessons. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. The pictures online are hilarious of kids fighting their way through this virtual thing. Yeah. So funny. But the flip side to it is, it's is that she gets all of her schoolwork done in record time and yeah. get on with her day and get back to playing with Legos or wherever the heck else she's doing during yes, the day. Yes, I know. Well, I and you know, it's been interesting to watch this because one of the things people I think didn't realize forcing kids that are like you know seven or eight or younger on the whole virtual thing is that none of them know how to type. <laughs> like, you know, we're all sitting there going, why is this taking so long? Because you're asking them to enter things, you know, now some of them are using iPads, which creates another problem because the iPad isn't compatible with everything the teachers are doing. So yeah, it's, it's been an adventure. Makes you appreciate, frankly, I know this is a hard hard right or hard left pivot, but makes you appreciate EXP Realty, the fact they've already gotten all the act right? together and how to operate virtually 10 yes, years ago. seriously. And, you know. They're the, the ones who should be doing the homeschool for the kids. They so, know all the widgets. <laughs> I don't even know. You know, you could tell, anyway, it's, you could tell it's Friday. It's Friday. Yeah, we've had a long week. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Uh, we have a great podcast for all of you guys today. We're going to be talking about three. First of all, we're going to start with some talking about some fantastic news. We have to often spend, you know, more than time we'd, than we'd like looking for, you know, good optimistic news to share with all of you. And, you know, it's some days this was more of a struggle than others. And today was one of those days. But the reality of it is, is that there's certainly lots of reasons to be optimistic about the housing market oh, yeah. lots many many reasons to be optimistic about 2021 and a lot of them are essentially stemming from artificial government well it is real stimulation but essentially the money that's being pumped into the economy that's keeping everything um looking like it's still very much a seller's market and no signs of that slowing down if anything we're going to be stuck in probably a perpetual state of the housing market being uh, essentially um what would you call it, Julie? A little crazy. In reinforced yeah. or essentially? Well, uh, um, artificially reinforced, yeah. Pumped yeah, up, basically. Supported. Yeah, so, so there's not going to most likely, from everything we're reading and the news that we're going to share with you guys today, um, you need to rejoice in the fact that we have what appears to be the makings of what, you know, is going to be a, a long-term, sustainable, steady housing market with lots of ebbs and flows and, you know, bifurcations and challenges and headwinds. But... You know, for the most part, there's not going to be a precipitous drop in pricing. That's the thing that we were most fearful of because if that whole train had left the station, trust me when I tell you, it's almost impossible to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And what Julie and I were fearful of is if there had been people that essentially would use this as the final excuse never to buy a house, maybe they got burned in the you know, housing crash from 07 to 08, 09. And now if they were to lose value again, that could have you know, essentially spoiled a whole generation of people, if not two generations of people from ever wanting to own a house again. That's what the underlying fear for, you know, for us was that if there would have been a huge dump in prices, that that would have been the end of it for a lot of the expectations that part of you know the American dream is owning your own home. And the reality of it, guys, is the exact opposite's happening. The reality of it is, is that there's lines outside of open houses. There's people that are bidding up houses like if it was a hot seller's market, because in essence it is. And now we're going to see, and going forward, we're going to see lots of more uh, momentum behind what will feel like very much a strong seller's market, despite the unemployment, despite all the other, certainly the social unrest and all the other political headwinds and everything else. Um, because why? Housing is something that everyone will always need. It's not something, you know, when you go into luxury houses and aspirational pricing, then it's a sort of different recipe, right? Buying second homes and all that. But as far as a primary residence, everyone's going to need a place to live. And as long as the uh, 
essentially, as long as the economics make sense to own versus renting, uh, people are going to buy. And that's what's always going to happen, always will happen, no matter what's happening in the marketplace. And the beauty of that is all, as far as you know, we're concerned and all of you guys should be appreciative of is the fact that housing is one of the few things in the economy that will not really, you know, yes, more sales happen if there's essentially a very strong underlying economy and more things, you know, sales will happen if people are feeling more confident and all those things are true. But even when those things aren't true, during 07, 08, 09, for example, there were still bazillions of houses selling because people needed places to live because there will always be sellers that have to sell. And so if you just focus on the fact that we are in an industry that is never going to really have a downfall as long as people don't want to live under bridges and in boxes, right? So as long as people want to buy houses and they want to have a roof over their head, you've chose the right industry. And I cannot, honestly, aside from maybe food staples and you know energy, and you know utilities. What else is like that in the whole economy? There's really nothing. Everything else could be deemed discretionary. People can keep their cars longer. People can you know do all kinds of different things with virtually every other type of expense there is out there, except housing. So, congratulations, you chose the right industry. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So speaking of which, just to put some statistics behind what you were just talking about. July pending home sales jump over 15% annually as properties go under contract in record time. So pending home sales, which measure signed contracts to purchase existing homes, increased by almost 6% in July compared with June, according to NAR. Sales were 15.5% higher year over year. Home sellers are seeing their homes go in contract in record time with nine new contracts for every 10 listings said NAR's chief economist, Lawrence Yoon. Okay, so that's this article goes on to talk about, um, you know, regionally pending home sales are up literally everywhere if you break up the country into the different quadrants, so I don't need to go into all of that. But basically, um, the facts are that if there's no shortage of clients, if the Yoon said, if 20% more homes became on the market, in other words, the inventory we're all looking for, we would simply have 20% more sales because demand is that high. So uh, July sales of newly built homes, which are also measured by signed contracts, also surged dramatically as buyers are now looking for new high-tech smart homes with floor plans designed for working and schooling at home. Builders are also benefiting from the severe shortage of existing homes for sale. So this is all good. Well, so the yeah. Fed came out yesterday mm -hmm. and they said they're gonna keep interest rates, we talked about this on the show mm -hmm. yesterday, they're gonna keep interest rates low for a long period of time. Yep. It was suggested as long as five years. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna make people feel, people feel confident being in real estate. And as, or assuming that there is some sort of protracted recession, which is the reason why the Fed is already saying they're gonna have a long-term low interest rate policy in anticipation of a long-term pr protracted recession, okay? So one thing's supposed to counterbalance the other. So people are going to be looking for places to put their money. People are going to be looking for places where they can safely, securely, you know, invest in something where they'll have at least a high probability that that investment will retain its value. That's the reason people are going to continue to flock to real estate and other asset classes too. So again, all this stimulus and all this government intervention, all this tinkering, we don't need to worry about the politics of it. We don't even need to necessarily think about the long-term ramifications of it. Just think practically and tactically about your own real estate practice and the opportunities that are in front of you. So, Julie, do you have any other points yes. from that article? Uh, no, that basically covers the bases. All Everything is up. We all need inventory. As soon as it pops up, we're going to sell it right off. So mm -hmm. this can, this really leads us to our next segment of the podcast. I think personally, there's going to be a surge and it, I think it's quite obvious. Mm -hmm. And I think so far our predictions are hitting almost 10 out of 10 that we started making really mm -hmm. in the spring of this year about what was going to happen as a result sure. of the coronavirus and whatnot. Uh, so the next obvious, and I think there's zero chance I'm going to be wrong about this. <laughs> you and I talked mm -hmm. about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a surge in new construction, oh, but yeah. not just the traditional subdivisions. There's going to be a surge in new construction and outlying areas that would have been perhaps less desirable before because people would be calculating how long it would take for them to get to the schools and all the rest of it. Um, and that's going to, the fact that people can telecommute, if, you know, that's kind of a funny old term, that in essence is what it mm -hmm. is. They can work online. And the fact that that's been essentially deemed to be widely acceptable from everything from taking your kids to school or just work, everything in between, you're going to see an expansion of people uh, who are uh, going to only want to work for employers where they can telecommute. We, we're hiring right now in our coaching business. And a lot of people are 
straight up saying, I will not <laughs> relocate. I do not want to work out of any office or whatever. That's essentially, even for the very basic jobs that we're hiring for, that's a that's almost a, it's a, probably 90% of all the people that we get resumes from, that's their minimum requirement. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine that's going to continue. It, why not? The quality of life is better. Well, it's not just become acceptable. It's become preferable. Right. You know, especially, I mean, if you got kids at home that are doing the homeschool thing, you, it's better to have a parent around, yeah. right? And, you know, it's interesting. I was hearing Zoe's online teachers say, if your parents are working, leave them alone. <laughs> you know, like they're trying to, to educate the kids so they can be pretty independent. So things like Zoom rooms and home offices and all of these things are definitely becoming more prevalent. And yes, absolutely new construction. You know, I mean, I'm seeing you and I look at stuff online all the time and you're seeing all kinds of new construction everywhere that's a little bit further out than it has been. We're also seeing, I hear this from coaching clients, um, suburban infill, you know, so the random lot in the subdivision that never got built, that's being gobbled up um, and everything in between. And then then some of the urban stuff is already converting from like big, um, you know, older office spaces. They're looking at turning those into smart conversions. So lots of new construction out there. You just got to know about it. So I had a, um, and we're going to give you guys some great points that will help you know exactly how you can generate listing leads. Um, we're getting to that and we'll get there in a second. I want to share with you guys a um, call I had with a really great coaching client on the West Coast. And I'll even tell you his name, Ben Salem. Longtime coaching client. He sells really expensive houses. He works with a lot of A-list actors. And some of the stories I've told you guys um, about some of the wackadoodle stuff that happens on the West Coast and real estate deals, those stories were from him <laughs> over the, you know, the past few years. But I was talking to him last night, actually, and, and um, he was in his office. He was the only person is in his office. Mm -hmm. The guy who was, you know, in the the front desk person is was now virtual, and so he showed me some pictures from his, you know, iPhone of what was going on outside of his office. Now his office, his his brokerage is called R Rodeo Realty, and they're guess where on Rodeo Drive, and they're in the heart of LA's, you know, most expensive area. And there was a Black Lives Matter protest going on outside. There was windows that were broken on the front of the real estate office. The um, and again, we're not getting into politics here. I'm just telling you no, what this you're picture facts. is. Right. The windows on his and his this brokerage in this very fancy into town were boarded up. He told me that the protesters are happening there pretty much. Uh, you know, 24 hours a day. They don't leave. Not just in front of, the, they're not protesting the real estate office. That's just where they're camping out. And then he started telling me about how there has been a massive uh, shift in the, so he used to primarily sell in, again, you know, all these really expensive, uh, fancy areas in LA. All the areas that you think of when you think of California, when you think of movie stars, when you think of all that, that's where he sold. Now, he, Ben told me that pretty much to a person, everybody wants to move away from those areas because they feel unsafe. And he was giving me, and he, he sent me some videos, I haven't watched them, as he was driving home. And as he was driving home, he describes he has to go under two overpasses. And over these overpasses, he said they're basically become homeless encampments because the local governments have basically made it so that there's no... Um, there's no way that the law enforcement can essentially uh, prevent people from setting up their own tent in somebody's front yard, in essence, if it's on the public thoroughfares. And that is the law, by the way, in almost every state. And that's something that has never happened before where you have, in essence, these really beautiful communities, these really these places where people have chosen to live and raise their families, where they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so he said that when he takes a listing there, then it's not something that's being widely you know, publicized, what's actually happening to home values. But he said it's almost impossible to sell the house even in this hot seller's market because everyone's moving away from those areas. And, and I asked him, so when did you start really feeling this huge migration? Was it a result of the pandemic? And he said, no, it's been going on for the past couple of years. But, and he said, but most noticeably since the pandemic. So we're telling you this because, again, not being political, right? Do not confuse what we're saying. I'm just re relaying some news that it was told to me last evening. And you guys are living out in, in those types of environments in some of these cities. You know exactly what I'm saying. Well, that social unrest, that feeling of insecurity, combined with the technological revolutions that are coming as a result of you know the wide level acceptance mm -hmm. of people being able to do everything online, and all the other things that we've talked about on our podcast and the things that you guys are experiencing, will open up a whole new chapter in the real estate story. And I, I'm, re I'm really grind down on this because I think it's true. People are going to choose to live not in the urban areas, not in the even the you know normal suburbs, 
people are going to go rural. That is that is what I think is going to happen, and I cannot see any reason why that won't happen. By rural, I mean areas of these big swaths of land, you know, in North Carolina, and South Carolina, and Tennessee, and just these different areas of the country where the, the property taxes are low, the quality of life is good, the air quality is great, that, you know, you can go outside and go on a walk and be amongst nature within five minutes, and you can buy a house and you can for less than $500,000 on a, you know, three or four acre plot, you can go and live this life that maybe some people always in those densely you know, populated urban areas all would have always dreamed about but couldn't really live there because of the fact that they were you know, physically locked into a specific geographic area because of schools and because of work primarily. Now, when all those you know, when all those things are no longer relevant, where people can live wherever they're going to live, you are already seeing where they're going to live. They're moving the heck out of those areas. And that trend is going to become a macro trend. There was a lot of people, like the CEO of Zillow, was saying, "This is we're not seeing any evidence that this is going to. This is what a few months ago where he was saying that that wasn't going to be a macro trend. Well, clearly it is. Well, how about thirteen thousand vacant apartments in New York City? That's right. some evidence for you. Right. Another. There was a big controversy because a very well-known uh, New York City-based entrepreneur. I have. I actually listened to his podcast. I can get his name. He came out and basically said New York City is dead. And he talked about it on his podcast. And everybody and their brother came out essentially reinforcing what he was saying or essentially trying to personally attack him, most notably Jerry Seinfeld. You know, Jerry Seinfeld basically went on a personal attack against this guy who is in this guy. If you listen to what he said and read what he said, um, it is an obvious argument that he is absolutely right because you have this mass migration out of New York City for all the reasons we just talked about and not to mention the ridiculous amounts of property taxes. And now you have all these businesses that are closing up and all that. So this whole thing is going to take a who knows how long to reverse. And the, the trend away from these urban areas, these densely popu populated areas, are, it's just getting started. So you're talking about a long-term trend. It's going to last, I don't know how long. Do you guys have any ideas? Do you have any suggestions or thoughts on this? So even New York City, which has been the shining you know, city on the hill, the, the essential, the fi financial capital of the world, they're seeing mass migration out again. And that's not just because of the pandemic. It's because of all the other things we've been talking about. It's going to be, uh, I think, essentially the momentum behind all that is going to be incredible because of the inevitable raising of the taxes in all these cities and all these states across the country because they're going to have to make up for lost revenues because of the pandemic and all the other things that are happening as a result of essentially the recession that might, who knows what's going to happen, right? So look for these trends, be aware of them and understand that all this means more opportunity for you if you're consciously aware of how it's going to affect you and you're being introspective about it. And as we've been saying, this might be the opportunity you've been looking for to change homestead to some place where you've always wanted to live and reestablish your real estate career. And if you have portable real estate skills, which is I'm giving you a perfect pivot here, sister. Mm -hmm. If you have portable real estate skills, if you have real estate skills that are not predicated on essentially buying leads, if not predicated on geographic farming, if you've got a business that is based on what's in your head, not wait, not essentially what you're buying, you can get up and leave and go over the heck you want to. Our coaching clients, I was telling you about Ben Salem, for example, and a lot of other of our coaching clients, they could pick up and leave and go wherever they wanted to live within probably 90 days, have a real estate practice that was just as you know powerful as the previous one that they left behind. And then they could get the referrals that came in off their old real estate business and send them to other agents and provide somewhat of a financial bridge for themselves. Anyway, I, the, the bottom line is, is have skills, make your business and your life skills based, and you won't be beholden to buying leads. And one of the best things you can be doing is accepting the fact that you have to be a listing agent. Listing agents have leverage. And how about that for leverage? Leverage of being able to get up and leave and restart your practice. And I've had, and Julie and I've had in over the years, many coaching clients that have done just what we said. And you know they'll move to, away from the cold climates where the economy is a little bit rough, and they'll go to some of these very affluent areas, like you know down in Florida, or maybe they'll go to Cal. Well, used to go to California, no one's going there anymore. But maybe they'll go to you know Arizona. Go, and now what we're seeing is a lot of people are moving to Colorado. They're moving to these other areas where they can be in nature. And okay, so again, if you are skills based, where if you can pick up the phone and you can actually generate your own business because you're proactive, you have that freedom. And that's what we want for all of you guys to at least consider for yourselves. One of the best sources of listing leads always will be and always has been expired sellers. And I'll give you the bottom line, bottom line reason why. 
And those of you guys who spend countless hours, time, and money trying to build complicated funnels and, in essence, buy your business, I want you to really do a gut check on all that. So you're spending all your time and money trying to uh, essentially find these supposed sellers that have their, you know, th that want to maybe someday sell their homes. And there's all these complicated analytical formulas and schemes to go about, you know, predicting which seller in the neighborhood is going to maybe want to sell or somehow, you know, figuring out some crafty way to use some sort of call to action to get the people to raise their hands and saying, yes, give me your free reports because maybe I'm interested in selling or send me a CMA. All these tried and true gimmicks that agents have been doing forever. And there's, and some of the gimmicks work. I'm, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But if your true motive is to generate listing leads and to essentially become a powerful listing agent so you have leverage. Doesn't it just make sense to look for the sellers in your community that already have their hands up in the air right now saying, I want to sell my house? I mean, isn't there, an, isn't there a level of just, I mean, we laugh every what time we say think? it. Because <laughs> it's so insane. Even in the hottest of sellers market right now, at the change of the month, which we're coming up on, you're and for the rest of the year, by the way, you're going to see droves of expired listings. And if there's no expired listings right in your own backyard, why don't you just expand your search ever so slightly? Mm -hmm. Or for fun, why don't you think about the place it, or places in the country you'd really much rather live if, if it's not where you live now? And go to figure out a way, find a realtor buddy there, have them run the expireds in that particular market. It, and then find out exactly what the opportunity would be if you just mastered the art of being an expired listing agent. And I actually had a very interesting text exchange with somebody who, um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it was actually quite humorous. It, he was very diligent. I'll give him credit. But the essence of what he was trying to do is he didn't realize who he was talking to, first of all. He basically sent me a cold SMS. Um, he thought I was a real estate agent. He was trying to basically sell us uh, social networking for the sake of lead generation. And of course, you can imagine that was basically like he was a you know a moth caught in a spider's web. And we went back and forth. And, and again, uh, and to his credit, he wasn't trying to lie because when I asked him specific questions about, in essence, like does social network, does, does a listing appearing on more than, you know, essentially more websites, more exposure, does it make a house sell faster, sell for more money? And I baited him because the answer is no. Every, every single research project that's ever been done has proven that more exposure for a listing does not in, in, essentially improve the outcome for the seller at all. Does that surprise you guys listening? Well, it shouldn't because that stuff's all just a gimmick. And then we talked, you know, he didn't try to lie and say it did. He didn't actually answer my question to his credit. And then there were some other examples too where, you know, we were talking about lead generation. The specific thing was I asked him why. Remember, I was just an agent who was trying to sell social networking assistance to. I asked him specifically why I would want to do social networking. What was the point of it? And he said, so that when people do a search on me, they can read my story. That was his line. And I've heard that before from yeah. a lot of these other social mm -hmm. networking gurus. To which I said, why would anyone care about my story? <laughs> this is really what I said. I said, at the end of the day, aren't they just going to be interested in whether or not I can actually get the job done of selling their home or helping them buy a home? Isn't that really what they're going to be focused on? And even then, why would I even want to bother worrying about finding people that are searching online? Why wouldn't I just go right directly to the people that have their hands in the rear right now saying, yes, I want to sell my house? Do you guys understand the insanity of what we're trying to explain to you? You guys spend countless hours and billions, and I mean that with a B, dollars per year looking for ways to craftily find people to somehow magically want to do business with you and you're hoping and praying that one day you're going to become a listing agent where Julie and I are telling you how to be listing agents now, telling you where to find the listing leads, sellers that have their hands in the air right now that say, yes, yes, I want to sell my house. We're telling you exactly what to say, exactly how to say it. And yet how many of you guys listening right now are saying, you know what, I'm just going to go run a Facebook ad. I mean, the whole thing, the fact that you guys have been suckered into believing yeah. that that's how you build a business, it's you have to laugh at yourselves. You really do. Hey, there's a reason why 85% of all realtors fail within 18 months or less. It's because they never, frankly, stumble across the truth about the fact that if you want ever-increasing levels of success in your real estate business, you have to master the art of doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. That's what we teach you to do. We're not going to lie to you. We're not going to, you know, uh, we're not going to essentially tell you what you want to hear. We're going to tell you the truth and you're just going to have to decide whether you want to accept it or not. And most of you do. And then I think especially in a changing market like this, 
you're going to realize that maybe all those gimmicky things were exactly what we thought they were and what we told you they were. And now you're finally ready to take your business seriously. That's what we want, how you need to shift your mindset because on the other side of that, is truly freedom, is the ability for you to start accumulating wealth. It's you no longer having to be beholden to, oh, I need to be part of somebody's team or, oh, I need to buy leads. I need to work on my marketing. I need to tell my story, which I love. I need to worry about Facebook marketing. I need to worry about learning how to make videos. No, you just need to learn how to pick up the phone and proactively lead generate. Call you know the sellers who have their hands in the air right now. There's 15 to 20 viable sources of sellers that are all within one degree of a, or another of being incredibly motivated to sell their houses. Why don't you just go after them? Why don't you set all this other stuff aside for the 85% of the agents that won't be in the business in 18 months? Doesn't this make sense, Julie? Totally makes sense. So on that note, would you like to talk briefly about our, one of our favorite spokes, one of our, our favorite, favorite spokes. Yeah. If we were to get back into real estate, Julie, if we were to, if that were to be our living yeah. and people ask this First occasionally, thing we do. like, you know, it's always hilarious when people ask us that. Yeah. They think we're going to say something different. Okay. So Tim, tell me, what's the deal? If you and Julie were to really get back in real estate, yeah. what would you guys do? I mean, what the hell do they think I'm going to say? Julie and I would start cranking out the TikTok videos like you've never <laughs> seen before. I mean, do they God really think us. we're going to say that? Isn't no, that funny? No, horrible. No. <laughs> I, it, here's we would the go after expires. And, and I think we're in agreement on that expired. Pool. And I, you know, our coaches would agree too. So here's the thing. And I had an interesting conversation with one of our coaching clients yesterday. We, we did a little round of victory dances. This has become a new tradition on the call. I love it. Yeah. And this was from somebody I hadn't heard from uh, before. I can't remember. I think he was in Florida. So forgive me if I'm wrong and you're listening. I, it was definitely somewhere normal, you know. And uh, he said, you know, I have victory to share I got a house back on the market that had expired and I was able to sell it in like a week. Okay. And I, I asked him, why do you think it didn't sell before? And why do you think it sold now? I'm trying to make it a coaching moment, you know? And he said, the answer is the same, which is interesting to think about what happened six months ago. We started to get into COVID. Well, can, we, can we start talking about what it wasn't? What? It was No, it wasn't. It wasn't because there wasn't enough marketing on it. No. It wasn't because the home brochure wasn't fancy enough. No. It wasn't because there wasn't a virtual brochure. It wasn't because there wasn't enough yeah. of all the things that you guys are being exactly. lied into believing is required to sell a property. It was. It was. Well, he said the answer is the same. COVID, because it, it didn't sell because of COVID because it was overpriced. There weren't that many showings overpriced. When, when they put it on the market. And he said, and now six months later, that's it expired. It was a six month that had some trouble and, you know, they had some showing lockdown in, you know, and overpriced. He got a better price. And guess who bought it? People moving out of the city, competing offers. Both of them wanted something semi-rural. And so he said, isn't it interesting that something that, you know, slowed it down before was the same reason that somebody bought it. And that's what we're seeing six months ago a lot of these expireds were ones that you know were launched nothing really happened nobody did anything about it they didn't reduce the price they didn't you know do what they're supposed to do so i made a list of why we love expireds here's the fascinating trend though yeah. that you need to take everyone needs to think about mm -hmm. because the markets change so quick because these macro trends are definitely picking up momentum a place that would like normally when a listing doesn't expire you immediately or when it doesn't sell and expires you immediately go after price condition location Right. And here's here basically is the way of thinking of it. And this is also one of the, you know, it's a condensed version of one of our scripts. Mr. Seller, when you're when you're when the market is essentially telling us what the market's saying about your property, it always comes back down to, you know, three distinct possibilities. And so I have some questions for you, Mr. Seller, help me work through this. You know, some version of that. Mr. Seller, so far we've had the house for sale for 30 days. You know, we've had five showings. And for the most part, no one really has anything bad to say about the location, which is good because we can't change the location, right? We can't pick up the house and move it across the street, or we can't obviously make it face west where it's now facing east and all the rest of it. So the location is not on a busy road, not a lot of bad feedback on the location. Really, for the most part, location is as good as it needs to be. So that's fantastic because that's the one thing we really can't change. Now, Mr. Seller, as far as condition, we've had a couple comments on that, but for the most part, you're not planning on adding a you know another bedroom or remodeling the kitchen or doing anything radical to the property, right? You're not on doing nope, anything like absolutely that? Absolutely not. What you see is what you get. So Mr. Seller, the only thing we can really have any positive influence on so that we position the house on the market correctly so it reflects the expectations of the buyer, notice how I didn't say price change, would be essentially repositioning the house on the market again so that it does correctly reflect the expectations of the marketplace. 
And so Mr. Seller, and then you lead into basically repositioning it, and usually that's going to result in a 10% price change. Again, that's a condensed version of our scripts you get as one of our coaching clients. These are all things that you learn, and once you learn how to save them, until you learn how to save them, until you've memorized them, you can have the script in front of you and just read it. It's perfectly fine. That's the way the professionals act. They follow, you know, scripts that are, you know, proven to, you know, generate a positive outcome for the seller and for themselves. That's called being professional. But in this market, here's the little weird thing that happens is the house could have very well been overpriced because of the things that Julie said. The buyer demand wasn't there because of COVID. But now the market condition has changed in such a way that the house is no longer overpriced. And matter of fact, the former That's expiring true. price might be the correct price now or might actually be lower than what the house is worth now, which is completely counterintuitive, but it's true. Yeah. Now, here's, here's a little mind you know mess for you guys to sort through. Sometimes you can have, and we had this happen when Julie and I sold yet real estate. Yes, that's right. Julie and I, are, I think what? We're the only real estate coaches. We're only, the only big name real estate coaches yep. that actually sold real estate. I believe that's The other true. big name real estate coaches that you guys are comparing us to never sold real estate. That's the reason they talk about social networking and such because they don't have a skills-based approach like we do because they don't have the skills because they never sold real estate. Put these pieces together, listeners. Okay. In a marketplace, do what do you want? Somebody that basically can, you know, uh, be a skills based and show you how to make money, show you how to actually solve people's problems, or going to just essentially be an idea bazaar to give you more gimmicks. Guys, I want to be as direct as I can without crossing the line with you emotionally mm -hmm. because it's critical that you listen. Otherwise, chances are there's an 85% chance that you're going to fail with, you know, in real estate. And so, where's my? What am I supposed to do here? Am I supposed to just hold myself back? Am I supposed to basically tell you what you, what you want to hear? No, I'm going to tell you the truth. And with that truth, you do whatever you want to with that information. So here's the thing that happens. When a listing expires, traditionally it's because of price, condition, or location. Now, if a listing expires now in this marketplace, it could actually be underpriced. And why would a listing expire the, uh, even if it was priced correctly? Tim, that doesn't make sense because here's why. Statistically, after a house has been for sale for about maybe two weeks and a, or, or to a, a month, the market starts passing it over. Mm -hmm. It's like spoiled milk. You just think of your own behavior. And this is, by the way, also one of the things that we teach you in the listing process when a seller is trying to wrestle with you about pricing correctly. Mr. Seller, you remember like when a new listing pops up in your neighborhood, everybody's excited about it, right? Maybe there's a, a sign in the yard that says, you know, this house, you know, coming soon type sign and people are excited about it. The neighbors are excited about it. You see cars swarming past it. Everyone is juiced up about it. And, you know, that new listing, boom, the new listing day happens. It hits everyone's. You see on Sunday, there's a line. There's all these uh, blah, 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 right? So that's, that still has that energy and the, and the momentum of being a new listing for what? A week or to. And then what starts to happen? You say, well, the house must be in contract. Maybe the agent just didn't change the sign from, you know, active to pending. Okay. Then a month passes. The house is still for sale. And then what happens? People start ignoring it. People just, they don't even see it anymore. They don't think about it anymore. Then a little while longer, what happens is that the whole complete marketplace starts to make up a story why the house didn't sell. Starts subconsciously and then it becomes, oh, I heard that house has a fill in the blank problem. That house didn't sell. And agents won't show a listing that's been for sale for a while because they themselves have biases against older inventory because they themselves will assume that the market passed it up. It must have some sort of problem. Uh, and that must be the reason why it hadn't sold. And so they're not even going to bother trying to sell it. And for them, and also they're not, they're going to talk their buyers out of wanting to see it for the same exact reasons, especially in the era of COVID where it's real hard to get showings in the first place, right? So that's what happens. The longer a listing stays in the market, it likes milk, it becomes spoiled. Now, here's the crazy part. You, that listing expires. It, you know, essentially is off the market for maybe a week, maybe a day or two, maybe a month, doesn't matter. And then it comes back for sale. New pictures, new description, new MLS, maybe even the same price or a slightly higher price. Then it sells the same day. Why did that happen? Because essentially the listing was seen again as a new listing and everyone was geeked up and excited about it again. Everyone online, all the agents, the buyers who had biases against that property and the agents that those buyers were working with, they've already passed through the market. They've already bought their houses. They're out of the market. You know, those agents who were working with those buyers who were, you know, had made up a story about that house, they're gone. They closed on something or decided to stay tenants or started to, decided to stay in their old houses. So now you're dealing with a new group of buyers that come into the marketplace and that to them is a new house. It's new inventory. 
and it sells as if it were the hottest thing you know since sliced bread. That's the thing you got to remember about expireds. Don't allow the biases of ignorance basically make it so that you think for some reason there's something wrong with the house. Oftentimes it could have been a host of things, but coming out of this COVID era the, with all these lockdowns, to Julie's point, that's what it was. So make the most of the uh, essentially the ignorance in the market. And by that, I mean agents inability to get price adjustments, agents inability to have the scripts and the skill sets to explain to the sellers what actually was happening. Agents inability to retain the listing, agents inability to all the things that skills require that most agents don't have are these, you know, the skills that Julie and I preach constantly. You develop the skills, you can then swoop in and you can basically pick up these expired listings. Going into next year, there are going to be a ton of expired listings as all the agents who did not have, again, the skills to get them priced right, to get them sold are going to not know how to retain them. The sellers are going to be frustrated with them. They're going to want to then list with different agents. That's what happens. That's one of the many reasons why these transitioning markets create the best opportunity. The money is still flowing, guys. The commission checks are still flowing, but they start to flow from the agents who had the social connections, the who, the, the who you know type agents, to the agents that have the what you know skill sets. That's what's exciting. So be where the, you know, essentially be part of this new group of agents that are going to make the money because they're skills based. Yes. So you covered most of my points, but I want to have them uh, write down some specifics on why you love expireds. Okay. So you mentioned one just now, and I just made it my point number one so we can segue easier. Okay. So point number one, why we love expireds. Almost always they sell right away. Exactly what you said. There's new enthusiasm. There's new pictures. There's new description. There's a new batch of buyers looking. If you actually compare days on the market for expireds to freshly listed inventory, it's lower. They almost always sell right away. Why is that? Okay, because usually because of price. So point number two, the CMA, comparative market analysis, is so much easier. It's been market tested, okay? It's, it's so much easier. So I can't, I don't need to go into that very much. Uh, next point is that uh, the number one agent that was in the mind of the seller has failed. That's a person that you might have had to compete against when it was a fresh listing and that you may or may not have won against because nine times out of 10, that person was in that seller's center of influence and you might have lost that. That person's already failed. So a lot of your competition is already gone. Because in a hot seller's market, the sellers are all still, oh, they don't, they're not that picky who they list with because they know the house is going to, you know, even overpriced with bad condition location, probably, it's still going to sell itself. It'll sell itself mm -hmm. just out of the MLS. So they're going to list with Betty Bebop that they know from wherever, and they're not going to be that particular. She yeah. could have sold no houses, and they're still going to list with her just because who knows why. So you know. they're buddies. That's yeah, it. That's and right. In this transitioning market, let alone the new market, Buddy Bebop isn't going to have a chance because that's the sellers right. aren't even going to interview her because they're going to know the market's changing. Now, on the expired side of things, they're looking for an expert, a specialist, someone to truly solve their problem. Which now they appreciate a lot more than fresh out of the gate, right? So uh, point number four related to that, the seller or sellers are always more coachable the second or third time around after humble. they've expired. They're humble. They almost beg you for help, mm -hmm. which is different when, than when they were fresh and thought their house was the best thing since sliced bread, right? So I hear it from students all the time. We used to hear it all the time. Just tell me what to do to get it sold. Just tell me. And then you can talk about any negative feedback and actually getting the repairs done and or price adjustment. But, but we, they'll do what you ask them to do. The but point. we wander into another little set of challenges that you guys can overcome with skills. A lot of these sellers won't be, essentially they were not priced uh, to the market because they may have owed too much or because of some right. extenuating financial circumstance. And because Betty Bebop never even thought to ask that question or maybe she was friends with them, that conversation about talking about some financial problem wasn't something that that seller was comfortable having with this person, this other agent. Again, guys, the, remember we talk about walking into a seller's house with a toolbox full of different tools, but you have to be skilled on how to sell, uh, essentially use each tool to solve the problem. This is what we're talking about. You are going to start experiencing what we're saying um, every single day, even working with buyers. And if you don't have the skill set, and if you're basically have invested all your time on the gimmicks and the sort of mental masturbation real estate ask, you know, marketing stuff, you're not going to be, no one's going to hire you. And again, you're going to essentially be real estate roadkill. Yes. And last but not least, I really like this last point. Unlike 
you know, waiting for somebody from your center of influence to call you or waiting on some impression to turn into some magically working out internet lead. Unlike all of that, with expired, you can choose your inventory. You want to go up market? Find a neighborhood that generally sells well, but might have been a little bit overpriced. Want to change geographic locations? Go choose your inventory. Want to increase your average sale price? Choose your listing inventory. Sick of having a bunch of yucky listings in your inventory? Go find something that has good curb appeal. You know, you can actually choose that. You can target, and I, I call this cherry picking, you know, on our uh, coaching calls. Let's say you've got 25 expireds that generally meet your, your you know, geographic criteria. You could choose your favorite five. And you choose. Is it because you really know the neighborhood? I tell our grizzled veterans, choose things where it expired in a neighborhood that you just sold something in. Sure. Because now you have the leg up. They've been passing by your sign that says sold on it. How much easier do you think that call is going to be? Conceptually, you guys are, there's no way you're in disagreement with what we're saying. Yeah. I mean, the, the bottom line is there's nobody that's going to be listening to this show and not understanding that what we're telling you is the stone cold truth. So here's the question you have to ask yourself. Why wouldn't you do exactly what we're telling you to do? Why wouldn't you do it? Why are you going to, you know, why are some of you right now, while you're listening to us, scanning through your emails, looking for the latest gimmick to somehow generate a buyer lead that probably will never buy? Why? Why do you do that? Is it because you're not serious about real estate? Maybe. Is it because you don't believe that you can do it? You can. I mean, if Julie and I can do it, trust me, you can too, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, in our market, our marketing program, our, you know, we're essentially our coaching program, our whole system has been market tested year in and year out for decades to work in all price ranges and all market conditions with agents of all different skill sets, all different education levels, all different everything. So it will work for you. If And some of you guys are saying, well, becoming a listing agent is hard. No, wasting your time trying to follow all these gimmicky ideas is hard. All the while, the financial clock is ticking, and you know in the back of your heart that you're not building enough momentum in your business. Aren't you sick of the gimmicks? Here it is. We're practically in September, and you guys are still, how many of you have never actually learned to do any of the things that we're talking about, and your mind is saying, well, I can just continue to do all this gimmicky stuff and Tim and Julie might be somewhat entertaining and I'm going to listen to them because maybe they're, I'll pick up a little nugget here and there. But you're not hearing the overall message. The overall message is you're holding yourself back. The overall message is you're thinking that you have less capacity than you do. You plug into our coaching program and one of the essentially we, it's we covered every aspect of your real estate business, but the primary focus is definitely teaching you guys how to be listing agents. We are going to teach you how to lead generate. We're going to teach you how to what to say, how to say it, how to overcome objections, how to pre-qualify. Mm -hmm. We've created a pre-listing pack for you. A pre-listing pack, basically, our pre-listing pack, when you do exactly what we tell you to do, and guys, look, this is not open for interpretation. This is not art class. Just copy what we tell you to do, how we tell you to do it. You send that ahead of time. That's going to take most of the, you know, most sellers, once they go through your pre-listing pack, when you get to their house or you do it virtually, they're not going to really have any questions for you because you'll have already answered all the questions, some questions they hadn't even thought about. The pre-listing pack does the heavy lifting for you. And I'm telling you guys, 90% of the time, by the time you come across that seller, when you follow our guidelines, you're, it's going to be a sign me up appointment. It's going to be just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. There's not going to be any sort of high level sales skills needed. Okay. I want you guys to think about that. Yeah. And so the pre-listing pack, and then there's the listing presentation. Sometimes, presentation too. right. Sometimes, sometimes you need the listing presentation. Sometimes you don't. And then there's the whole process that happens with negotiating the sellers, with the sellers, you know, in terms of getting the house sold. We have created all of this for you. All you would have to do is plug yourself in. You don't have to look for the answer. This is the complete solution. You don't have to just, do, I'm going to, you know, get a little here and a little there. That's a hackish approach. You couldn't open any business taking that, you know, approach did. If you wanted to open up a pie shop or a gym, the probability of you being successful opening up your own gym goes to the roof if you were to essentially plug into a franchise. Now, we're not a franchise, but our system is a system similar to a franchise. So consider not putting yourself through the pain, anguish, and the financial hardship of doing what, you know, again, 85% of all agents fail within 18 months. Why is it? Because they aren't willing to follow a system that works. Maybe they haven't, they don't know that it exists, right? I mean, in their defense, maybe they've never come across us like you guys have. Maybe they haven't read our book. Maybe they aren't coaching clients. Maybe they never really, you guys get the point. So in their defense, had they stumbled across us, they probably would have not been one of the 85% that fail. So I'm strongly encouraging all of you. And, and look, guys, I apologize. 
I mean, especially Julie. She was way too rude today on the podcast. <laughs> I do my best. Yeah. But I, you know, look, I know sometimes that um, me in particular, I come off a little bit too direct. But if I don't take that approach, if I'm not a little over the top, you won't listen. And you're just going to basically listen to the end of our podcast and then you're just basically going to slip back into the, the path that you were previously on. And we already know where that goes. And so do you, right? It, it, if you're going to rely on buying leads, you're always going to be beholden. If you're going to rely on what you've been doing, which is basically the roulette wheel of luck. Okay, where's my lead going to come from today? Ding, 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 ding. I'm going to start basically buying leads. I'm going to go on social networking. I'm going to do an Instagram video. I'm going to do all this gimmicky stuff, hoping and praying that a lead, that somebody's going to call you. Would you? How is that a business? That's insanity. That's not predictable on any level. No. And you know what's funny, Tim, as you were talking, I was thinking about some of the conversations that I've had with our coaching clients who are very well established listing agents, right? And they're talking about how they actually have to sell fewer houses than the agents who are A, primarily buyer's agents, but B, definitely buying their business. Because they're net, I had a conversation with one of my uh, elite coaching clients last week. She's like, I can't believe how great my net is. Of course. And, and, you know, some of this, yes, is related to the fact that houses are selling quickly and you don't have a lot of marketing costs. You don't have to keep them around for six months and continue to, you know, spend money on them. But she was just like beside herself how much better her net was being a listing agent than when she had been more like a 50-50, little bit buyer heavy and had been paying for more of her business. You know, she had broken up with Zillow and done some of these other things. She's like, I, I can't even believe it. I've got to make sure I'm keeping up on my taxes and this That's and right. that, you know. I'm like, nice yeah, yeah, you do. Nice problem to have. Yeah. She's like, I can't even come up with where to spend it. That's, you know? but, I mean, but that's a nice problem to have. On the personal side, not on sure. the business side. Yeah. But and so what Julie is describing for those of you, you know, I'm, I know there's a couple of you that don't know what she just said. But let's say a commission check comes in. You sell a you know three hundred thousand dollar house, and let's say you make nine thousand dollars. You pay your broker, you know, let's say you pay your broker twenty percent or whatever it is, and then the rest of it goes to covering your own, you know, business and personal expenses, right? Mm -hmm. When you follow our system, a vast majority of what goes into your pocket, you keep. Yes. Because we're not asking you to spend your money generating leads. A little known thing. It's kind of a side <laughs> benefit, you know, that I'm reminded of a lot. But yeah, I mean, listing agents win on every level. That's that's the bottom line. It, and, you know, you know. I could go on forever about the insanity of buying leads. And the buying leads people, they're becoming a new religion, right? They're the ones that are basically trying to stomp out our message. You don't have to buy leads because a lot of these buying leads guys, they don't know how actually to proactively lead generate themselves. The only thing they know how to do is buy leads. And now they're trying to sell other people into the belief that they have to buy leads. It's the passing on of a, you know, the stupidity virus, basically. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, again, I know I'm being overly direct. I'm trying to make you guys laugh. But in the interim, please take it seriously. Please consider what you want your future to be like. There is a place for marketing. There is a place for teams. There are places, you know, it does make sense in some cases to think about, you know, branding, whatever that means. All these other types of places, there are things for that, but they're not the pointy end of your business. The pointy end of your business has to be skills-based and has to be predicated on proactive lead generation. Otherwise, how else are you going to consistently generate business, consistently make income? And what you'll discover as you learn how to master the art of being a proactive lead generator, you're not ever going to fall prey to any of the gimmicks because you won't need to for the reasons that Julie just stated with that coaching client example. So guys, listen, you can listen to our thousands of past podcasts on everywhere, including, by the way, uh, Amazon on Audible, which is fantastic, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher. It's on about 20 different platforms now. We are ha we have listeners in over 50 countries, which is an incredible honor for all of us. Um, and wake up to the reality that you have made the right move having a real estate license. You have made the right move being in real estate right now. You have made the right move listening to this podcast. Now it's all up to you to take the right actions to essentially get the benefit of the past version of yourself that was smart enough to have done those three things. Now move forward, guys. If there's anything we can ever do for you, 512-758-0206. That is my text. Text me with show ideas. Text me with questions, comments, concerns. Anything that we can do will be of service to you. And remember, guys, Julie and I are always interested in talking with you about joining our EXP Realty team. If that's something that is interest to you and most of you have EXP on your radar, let's talk about it. Let's see if we're a good fit for Julie and I to be your sponsors in EXP. So text us directly at 512 758 In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show on Sunday.
This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris.